a brand new series this week. It's called Red Letter Day. And it's kind of a heavy series. We're going to be in it the whole month of March. Because we're talking about the last words of Christ. And before I get any further, I just want to give credit where credit's due. Pastor Craig Rochelle from Life Church in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, was the one that put most of this series together. Though the messages are going to be a, a, a mixture of mostly of, of our stuff. But as we think about the last words of Christ, and today we want to go to Matthew chapter 27. Turn there with me. And we want to look at the, the phrase that Jesus said when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Heartbreaking, heart-wrenching moment. You can't even put into words the emotion you're feeling. Can you think of the last time you felt like that? Can you think of the last time you struggled to even put into words how broken, how betrayed, how hurt, the unexplainable pain, the loss, all of us have had situations like that. And if you haven't yet, hold on, because you will. And it'll probably be more than once. Woohoo! Thanks for the encouragement, Scott. Really appreciate that. I could have just turned on the news to see that. But the fact of the matter is, um, all of us, we, 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 we get into situations like that. I remember in 2006... Uh, so for some of us, the, the, the first thing that pops in your head is, is a family situation of just, I'm at a loss for words. I'm so broken just over this. Maybe it's the health. Maybe a health situation, situation in your, in your body. You're like, I have no words. I'm so frustrated. God, what's going on here? Maybe it's a loss of a loved one, whatever. I, I was thinking about all the things, and maybe it's something to do with your job, your work. I was thinking about even in 2006. It was the fall of 2006. And I, I look back now, and it's easy to see that I think it was actually the start of the recession that was about to hit our whole nation. But for whatever reason, the RV industry got hit first. And so it was in 2006 we had just built the two-story expansion over here. The church was, it, it, the attendance was higher than it had ever been, even honestly higher than it is now. And we had lots more people and we had, but for some reason in the fall of 2006, it's like the finances of our church just went, Err! and hit the skids. And I remember thinking, okay, um, uh, I'm concerned. <laughs> God, what's going on? And I took time, and I actually went away for three days. I prayed. I said, God, hello. Did you really bring us this far only just to let us down? I mean, just, where are you? What's going on? We've all had situations like that, haven't we? Where we've questioned, what is it for you? Your God, where are you moment? God, why have you left me here moment? And as we look to Matthew chapter 27, we begin to peek into a situation that even our Savior, Jesus, found himself in, in verse 37. Check this out. Matthew chapter 27, verse 37. It says, above his head, so Jesus is on the cross, and there was three of them crucified that day. And just to mock him, above his head, they'd put a plaque. The written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. They were mocking him. Yeah, yeah, whatever. You said you were the king. And now we're going to make fun of you. In verse 38, he says, two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. We're going to talk more about that later in this series. Verse 39, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying things. You who are going to destroy that temple 
and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if, in fact, you are the Son of God. They were quoting what he had said earlier. Basically, they're saying, you said you're going to do this. So now, <laughs> here you are. Where is your God in the middle of all this? Verse 41, in the same way, the chief priest, the teachers of the law and the elders, they mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't even save himself. He's the king of Israel. Ha! Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him then. Isn't it interesting who it was hurling these insults? It was the elders. It was the religious. Look at that. What's it say? The chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders. These were people that knew the scripture. They knew the Torah. But for whatever reason, their mind had a wall there. They could not receive Christ as the Savior. The people mocking Jesus on the cross were the religious elite. And as I was studying this week, I just felt like I just needed to just remind you and just to prepare you that there are going to be other, and there already are other religious elite in our country, in our community, who are going to come against you. They're going to begin to, they're, they're, I'm talking people who go to church every Sunday, but they start walking away from the truth of Scripture, and they no longer hold this as the authority in their life. And when those of us who do, and those of us who stand and say, the, the Word of God is what I build my life on, I believe this right here, it's God's Word all the way through, they're going to begin to mock you. I doubt, I, I don't know as if they'll ever put you on the cross, but they're going to mock you, they're going to stand against you, and we need to be ready and be prepared because they mock Jesus in the same way. The next four words really hit this whole mockery. Look at verse 42. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we believe in him. Verse 43, he trusts in God. They were saying, where's your God? You're still going to trust in God? I mean, when you're hanging there on the cross, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Where is your God now? Now admittedly, if you were there looking at Jesus hanging on the cross, you might ask that very same question. Every one of us have asked the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Hello? Come on, we've all asked that question. Sometimes even about ourselves. God, I thought I was being faithful. I thought I was doing everything. But we forget that God even chooses at times to use trial, to stretch us and teach us. And, and they say, he, you trust in God? Even as you're on the cross, you're still going to trust in God. But listen, if you would have seen him, you would have been deeply disturbed. Because scripture lays this out. Remember, they beat him, abused him severely. They, he probably didn't even look like a human being. Think about this. They took his shirt off, his clothing off. They whipped him probably 39 times across the back with a leather whip that would have had pieces of glass and metal sharp objects that would literally rip his back open as they're whipping him. They're, it's, it's understood that as they would flog and they'd, they'd whip him, uh, the prisoners like this and the people they're, they're beating, that they're, it would open up. I know it's grotesque, but you could actually see some of the organs inside because that back was so mutilated. They blindfolded him, and with their big signet rings, they pounded his face over and over and said, Pro hey, yeah, tell us who hit you. Prophesy. And they put the crown of thorns. Yeah, you're a king. Ha. I'll, give you a, I'll give you a crown here. Thorns, long thorns, dug it into his skull and his head. They kicked him again and again. They spit on him. They took the creation, the creator. They put him down on the ground on pieces of wood and they drove nails into his hands and his feet, scripture says. They hung him on that cross. They said, well, you still trust God? Where is he now? Where is he now? Trust. Trust. Look on the screen here. Trust. 
This is, this is the Greek word, to convince, to rely on with inward certainty, to have full confidence or complete trust. They're saying, do you still have complete, total trust in God? You see, it's very easy to trust in God when things are going okay, right? But it's difficult to trust in God for many of us when life goes dark. And all of us at some point have to answer this fundamental question right here. Do you still trust in God? From the beginning of creation, every force of hell would try to undermine the character and the authority of our God and the goodness of our God. Do you remember the serpent? Nah, did God really say that you shouldn't eat of that fruit? Attacking. Do you really trust that God's word is true? From the very beginning, that was the way that the enemy used to get in there. Think of the last dark place you found yourself where you struggled to trust that God was still in control. Speaking of dark, here's what the Bible says about darkness in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. Look, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. You know what the idea is? When it says all the land, we're talking like the whole earth was dark. The sixth hour, we understand at this point, is, is for them, for, for us, it means about noon. To the ninth hour, that was about three o'clock. So for three hours, it just got dark. It's, it's as if it was midnight, but it was noon. To three o'clock, it got dark. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. And the, he cried out in a loud voice. It's, it's kind of an understatement. Because as you study the Greek and you look at that in a loud voice, it was a scream. It was an all-encompassing with, with, with all that was in, in him. He had endured all the abuse of, of men without complaining. And it's so hard for me to go here. For years, I've struggled with this verse. I remember literally I was talking with a staff a resident theologians, Matt and Jason and myself, <clears throat> in staff meeting, we talked about this. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I struggle with this. said, God the Father, how can, how can he forsake the Son? And, and just the, the theological implications. And I've thought about it for years, but I'm convinced after study that it was at this moment God the Father, in fact, did withdraw His presence. God the Father separated Himself from God the Son, and Jesus cried out screaming, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just think about that. Not one time when he was arrested do we see him saying, God, where are you? Not one time when he was in the midst of the trial do we see Jesus questioning God. Not one time when he's being beaten, crown of thorns, flogged, nailed to the cross. It wasn't until that moment that pushed him over the edge. When God withdraws, Jesus screams out in agony, I can't take this. I don't understand this. Why have you forsaken me? Another thing that's interesting about this is, is he uses the term God. Whenever, I don't, I don't want to lose you in theology here, but we believe in the Trinity. The Bible teaches the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is all three of those. All three of those are God. It's just God. They work together. They're just a ten. That's the way it is. But whenever Jesus, in his ministry time, you study scripture, study the gospels, whenever Jesus would talk about God the Father, he'd usually always say Father. In fact, it was kind of like the, the terminology we would use today, like Papa, like Daddy. That's the, that's the word, that, the, the heart that, that Jesus would say, Daddy, hey Daddy, hey Father, hey Papa. Notice what he said here. He said, God, 
my God, even there's just a, a, a slight change in the way it's even portrayed in, in what may be one of the saddest verses in the Bible and possibly even one of the most confusing. Even Martin Luther, centuries ago, said, how can God forsake God? I don't quite understand it all, and I, I'm not even going to try to jump in to explain it, but I, I will say this. I'm absolutely convinced that on the cross at that moment, God the Father turned and said, I can't. I can't look at this, and I'll explain that in just a few moments. I'll get there. But God the Father forsook God the Son, turned his back on him. And isn't this just like, in a sense, human nature? All these questions. He embraces the one question that almost all of us ask at some point in our lives. When it all goes dark, we don't understand, we end up asking the question of, why? Why? Look around this room for just a second, can you? Just look at the people. At some point or another, this room is full of people who have walked through dark times. <sighs> Some of you, I've walked with you. You've been a part of this church as you walk through that. Some of you right now are walking through dark times. You walk through times of betrayal. You walk through deep heartache. You walk through the loss of children. You walk through the loss of some hurt and pain that I wouldn't even wish on my enemies. And the, the reality is we have to understand that we're not always going to understand. And that hurts. It's painful that some things are going to happen and we're just never going to understand why. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, just a reminder. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then, when I stand before Almighty God in heaven in glory, I'm going to know then, even as I'm fully known. And if you and I can come to grips with, a, with this truth that there's some things I'm just never going to understand. I'm never going to understand August 10th, 1990, when my parents went to be with Jesus when I was just a teenager. Never understand that. But if I can come to a point where I'm just like, okay, I'm never going to understand that, God. I just, I give that to you. Give me the grace to keep going. The tragedy, the tragedies, the tragedy, the situation, the heartbreak, the health issues. There's things we're just never going to understand. I just can't. I just can't understand it right now. The, th the issue is we only see in part, but God sees the big picture. Let me illustrate it this way. It's a little bit like this. If I held this up and asked you, what two words do you see? Many of you would say, uh, I need binoculars. But other than that, many of you would say, no, where? No, and others of you would say, now here, a lot of people at, at hard times, they say God is nowhere to be found. He's nowhere. Others, as we stay faithful, as we keep pressing on, get to know God, they say, no, no, he's now here, even though I don't understand it, he is here. Even though I don't understand, he is here. He's now here. Here is God when, when we got the girls shots, um, for whatever reason, you know, I have three daughters, and I remember especially when they're little, you know, you're holding that little bundle of joy, and everything's great, and sometimes when they're young enough, they don't even know it's coming, and next thing you know, it's like they get to right in the, uh, or, you know, and, and, and they're looking at you like, you're letting them do this? Why? They can't talk like that, but they just say, it's only, why? I mean, you know that they're upset. Why, why, why are you allowing that doctor, that nurse, that whoever to do that? It's because you see the bigger picture. You know that that, whatever that shot, it, that that's something they need to keep them healthy. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways my thoughts than your thoughts. 
nowhere or now here. The good news is this. Let me just sum this up. God's word gives us some things that we need to remember when we don't understand. When you don't understand, when you're, when you're like, I, this is something I'll never understand, God's word gives us some very good things to hang on to, to hold on to, because how do we get from the place in life where we're like, God is nowhere to be found in this circumstance to the place that we say without a doubt that God is now here. Scott, I feel like God is nowhere. How do I get to now here? Let's be honest. Some of us here this morning, you're not in a crisis. You, you would, if, if, I, if, if I showed a picture of your life, it looks something like this. Very just at peace. You're just like, ah, all is well in my world. And just uh, some of you walked in here today, and you're like, Scott, I, I'm not really in turmoil. I've, I just, I really feel good about where we're at in, the, in my family, my job, my future. And then there's other of you who would look a little bit like a little more windblown, a little bit more like this. <laughs> a little bit like even the thing I got to shield me from the rain is now blowing away, and it's turned inside out, and the wind is coming against me, and and, and it, it, it's kind of like uh, um, you get to the point where the chaos and the hurt and the confusion are so great that holding on to who God is leaves you with that white knuckles and worn out spiritual muscles. You're like, I'm on the last thread. I'm holding on, but just barely. Write this down. This is what you got to remember. The first one, write this down. We're going to remember this, that God is good. God is good. Taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord is good. Psalm 100 verse 5. For the Lord is, what's it say? Good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Mark chapter 10 verse 18, Jesus is talking to the rich young guy. He's saying, no one is good. No one except God alone. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the what? Good shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. From the very beginning to the very end, the Word of God declares something that sometimes is hard for you and I to remember, and that says, God is just good. The Lord is just good in every situation. And here's why this is important that we grasp this, because we tend to project our present situation on God. When we're confused, and when things happen that we don't understand, we say, God, why have you left me in this place? I don't get it. Where are you at? When things happen that are bad, we sometimes think maybe God isn't good because he's allowing this, right? Come on, let's be honest with one another. Have you ever thought, God, I'm not so sure you're good? And we sang it a few moments, so you're good, good Father. But all of us at times have probably had a season where we're like, I'm struggling with that one, God. That's when we have to come back to the Word of God. We have to decide, am I going to believe what my emotions say or what I think? Or am I going to build my life on something that's so much bigger than me? And that's the Word of God. I'm not saying it's easy. In the middle of cancer, we have to be able to say this. God is good. In the middle of hurt so deep that we can't even explain it, and it even affects our lives for years, even then, Scripture says, we just read it all, God is good. In grieving a loss, God is good. In war, we have to say, God is good. Even in the atrocities of of, of um, genocide. We have to declare, because Scripture says God is good. When hanging on a cross, being cut off by the Heavenly Father, mm, He's still good. He's always good. Wrestle with this. 
But make sure at the end of the day, if you're committed to following Christ, that wherever you end up, that you end up lining, lining up with the Word of God. Listen, I know. There, I, the more honest I am with, with my Savior in prayer, the more honest I am, it seems the more healing and peace I can find. Listen, God already knows what you're thinking, right? So I'm just, I'm shooting straight with you. There have been many times in my life, I shouldn't say many, but there have been definite times in my life where I just, I said, God, if you are good and your word says it, I'm not feeling it right now because this doesn't feel very good at all. And it's in those moments of just bearing my heart to God that I can actually find the most peace. And so my encouragement to you is, you're struggling today. You're saying, I, I, I want to believe that, Scott. I want to believe he's good, but you're struggling. Can I just encourage you, just lay it out there before him. Build what you believe, not on your experience, but on what we know is truth. I had gallbladder surgery. I keep talking about this. I hope you don't get tired of it. It just affects me every day. That's all. I had gallbladder surgery. Pain came on that one Saturday night in January. Oh! Within, what, a, a week, week and a half, I'm going under the knife. Just a... They, just, they took that puppy out. It sounded like that, too. I mean, it was, honestly, as far as surgeries, I, no one likes surgery, but it, was, it went really well. Very smooth. Got me right in. Um, uh, you know, and, and just it, as, I, as I recovered, everything has really gone really well. And, you know, it's really easy in something like that, I mean, even in the midst of, God is good, God is good, God is good, and we can even throw in there all the time, God, blah, whatever, and God is good. Okay, now, now let's talk about my, my brother-in-law, Chad. Chad McAtee's up in Canada hunting in the middle of a lake in a boat when he gets this attack. Ooh! It's like, I don't know what, I feel like I'm dying. I wasn't there, he told me about it. Oh! And they literally, they, they have to eventually call off that day of fishing and they get back to the shore. It's nighttime. I, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding this. They couldn't even find their cars. They're up in Canada hunting, fishing. It's dark. He has to sleep in a tent all night with that excruciating pain that took me to the ER in about, you know, uh, no time flat. And I got some medicine on the pain. Ooh, that feels good. <laughs> Not Chad. He's out in the woods in a tent all night, writhing in pain. Sun comes up. They pack it up. They go across the border into Minnesota, check into a small hospital, and they say, you got issues. He's like, you're kidding. Ah, uh, hello, I know I have issues. And they end up having to cut him all the way open. That sounds gross, doesn't it? But he's got gangrene setting in. He's got all kinds of infection. He's, I mean, he's in the hospital up in Minnesota for over a week. Is God good to Chad? I mean, when my surgery just goes, I said, like, God's good, God's good, God's good. Well, here's the deal. God's even good in Chad's, because God is good. When someone gets healed of cancer and someone else has to go through the horrible, horrible chemotherapy and, and other things, like Linda at least walking through right now, part of our church, I mean, my heart goes out to her and others of you who have walked through that, you go through, why would God heal one person and say, God's good. God's still good. God's good. I know I'm taking a lot of time on this one, but I just really felt like we need to hit this. We need to wrestle with this. We need to get down deep in our heart, the understanding. Never forget, God is good. Let's go to the second one. Know this. God is for me. What to remember when you don't understand? Remember God is good. Remember God is for me. Romans 8, 28, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Let's go all the way back to verse 28. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, 
who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. Then he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Remember, in your hardest of times, in the most painful moments of your life, can I just encourage you, when you feel like Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can I just remind you of something today? God is for you. When you feel like everyone else has turned their back, let me tell you, God is for you for you. God authored, he who authored everything. The Bible says he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He is, as we sang today, the great I am. He breathed the stars into place. The scripture says that the same all-powerful God that placed the stars in the heavens is your God today, and he is for you. He's an advocate for you through the Holy Spirit. He believes in you. He has a dream and a purpose that is beyond the confusion that you're facing today. Let me say that again. If you're facing confusion today and you're like, I don't understand, let me tell you, he's got a plan for you that's beyond that confusion. Take heart. God is for you. Remember verse 28, though I put it in yellow. Those who love him. How do you, how do you show that you love him? You keep his commands. So listen, if you're going to live like the devil, if you're going to go out there and live in sin, and brother, listen, there's, there's, how, how can we expect? How can we, I'm not saying you've got to live a perfect life, but I'm telling you, if you submit your life to Christ in his leadership and his lordship, we can stand on this promise that God is for you. Remember, in, in January, we talked about John chapter 15, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. If you remain in me, if if my word remains in you. So here's the deal. If, If we stay in Christ and we follow him, you don't have to be perfect. But I'm saying you've committed your life to following Christ. And know as we pray, he hears and he'll answer according to his will. We have that promise. He is for you. Third thing, write this down. Remember this, God is with me. Remember, we talked about how it wasn't until that last moment when Jesus yelled out to the Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? I I don't know about you, but the moment that I would get arrested for doing the will of the Father, I think I'd have a hard time with that. Huh? If police would literally walk in the doors right now and say, Scott, we're arresting you for preaching the gospel, the truth of the word of God, you're under arrest. And they cuff me and stuff me. I, I, my flesh would be like, no likey. <clears throat> I know for sure if I had to sit through trials and I knew I was, I was innocent, it would be hard for me not to say, God, where are you? Hello? Step in at any time. Hello? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you start beating me up, Start smashing in my face. Start, I can tell you right there, my faith, as strong as it is, yet my faith is still going to struck. God, where are you? Jesus, not a, not a peep, not a word. How is Jesus able to go through all the, the, the arrest, the trial, the beatings, the cross, nails, all that? He was able to go all the way through that without, without ever pushing him over the edge. But There came a moment on the cross that we see recorded in the Gospels, specifically today in the the Gospel of Matthew, where it pushed him over the edge. Why was he able to, you know why? Here it is. Because God the Father was with him. He knew when he was arrested, my Father's with me. He knew when he was going through that trial, my Father's with me. He knew when he was being beaten, flogged, he was... I'm sure his flesh didn't like it. I'm sure he cried out in agony and pain. But he understood, my father's with me. Even as they drove those nails into his feet, his ankles, whatever it was, and his hands, he knew his father was with him. But there came a moment where his father was no longer with him. And it was at that moment that that God the Father turned his back on him. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's actually a quote of Psalm chapter 22. Jesus knew that he would be temporarily separated from God the moment he took upon himself the sins of the world. Because listen, Habakkuk 1.13 says, God cannot look on sin. When Jesus was in the garden saying, oh, take this cup from me, this was it. It wasn't just all of this and then the cross. The, the moment I think Jesus was really, that, he was so struggling with this, he knew there was going to have to come a point where God the Father had been with him the whole time. You know, he didn't do anything unless the Father told him and, and it was the will of the Father his whole life. But he knew on that cross, there was going to come a moment where his Father was going to forsake him on behalf of all of us. It's because of my sin, your sin, that God the Father had to look away and forsake his son. Jesus suffered this double death so that we would never have to experience eternal separation from God. And because of what Jesus did, and he was able to do that and willing to do that, we can now proclaim what Scripture says in Hebrews 13, 5. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Our God says, now, because of what Jesus did, because Jesus was forsaken, because he became sin, now, now, we, we, Jesus will never, ever forsake us. Our God will never forsake us. Know this, God is with me. Even when we don't understand, we can always remember that God is good, God is for us, and God is with us. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. So the question I would ask you is this. Do you trust God? Because it's easy to trust him when everything's going good and you're in the light, but it's more difficult to trust him when you're walking through that darkness. You remember Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Because your own understanding, my understanding sometimes is finite. I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't, I wish I understood things more than I do. But I can't wrap my hands around some things. But I know this, if in all my ways, if I acknowledge him, the, the word literally means if I know him, if I do what, what, what I know God, if I embrace God to know him, if I, if I acknowledge him, he will make my path straight. I can trust him. Here's what I'm finding in my life the older I get. <clears throat> the better I know God, fill this in, the less I ask why and the more I ask what. The more I grow in Christ, and this would be my challenge to you, I'm not, say, I'm, I'm not condemning anyone who asked the question why in this room. If it's in your heart, lay it out there before the Lord. But let me tell you, the more you grow in Christ, this is what's going to happen. You're going to find yourself asking less why and more what. Instead of why is this happening, God, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing what I want? The better I get to know God, the more I ask what? God, what is it you're trying to teach me through this? What is it you're saying here? When so many people say God is nowhere to be found, I say, okay, God, um, you're now here. I know that because your word says you're never going to leave me and forsake me. Jesus already died on the cross. He was forsaken so that I wouldn't have to be. Whew, man, that, that's almost too powerful just to jump right past, Right? Jesus was forsaken by God the Father, so I wouldn't have to be. How powerful is that? You ask, why did God forsake Jesus? Why? The answer is in, in, in Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Here it is. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became sin. Why? So that we might be made righteous. Why did God have to forsake Jesus? Because Jesus became sin. 
I know this is almost too graphic, but you got to get the, the, the heaviness of this. On the cross, Jesus became murder. He became adultery and lust and lying and pornography and cheating and racism and hatred and any other sin that existed in this world. Jesus became sin and God had to look away because his eyes are too righteous to even look upon sin. And Jesus died for our sins so that our sins could be forgiven. But here's the good news. We're about to celebrate this the last Sunday of March. Jesus didn't just die. Three days later, he rose again, conquering death, conquering hell, conquering the grave, conquering every sin that ever, ever, ever will befall us. He's alive. Jesus was forsaken for me and for you. And let's grasp that and let's understand that. I want the worship team to come as discreetly and quietly as they can. Because I want the rest of you to listen to me. No matter what you're going through, listen to me. Never, ever forget this. Listen, God is good. He's for you. And he'll never, ever leave you. God is good. He's for you. He's never going to leave you. Do you remember the story I opened up with? It's 2006, the fall of 2006. It's like, God, where are you? I went away for three days and I prayed. And you know, the term I use is I wrestle, I, I would say this, I wrestled with God. You know, I'm no Jacob by any means, but in the Old Testament, do you remember Jacob wrestled with God? Now, and I, I literally, I, I didn't like see God, wrestle with him physically, but spiritually, I just, I just really, just like, God, this is what I see. I'm standing on your word. I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And, you know, I felt a release. I came home on that Wednesday. I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just, I feel like God's involved. That Sunday night, we had a prayer night at our church. We were up in the great room and we were praying. And I remember tangibly, I don't know if maybe even some of you were there that night. I remember tangibly sensing and feeling God's up to something. For the, like one of the first times in months, I just had just a real sense of peace. There was a prophetic word that came forward. I remember walking down the hallway upstairs and turning and saying, I think God's got this. I think, I don't know what it is. I have no idea what the answer is. But we're just praying, believing God is going to somehow, the financial hole that we found ourselves in, what were we going to do? What was God saying? It was, oh, just, but I had such a sense of peace that day. And some of you know the rest of the story. That week I got a call from uh, the, one of the head honchos of DJ Construction. They built this two-story addition for us. We paid them for it, but they built it. And uh, one of the things they said is when we hired them, it said churches are different than other buildings and other, other things we build. When we build churches, they have a heart for the kingdom of God. And DJ Construction said, we're only going to make this much profit. And as long as we make that profit, anything over and above that, we're going to give back to the church. We do this with every church. And I was like, okay. So in the midst of that construction project, we actually added 10 feet. That building is 10 feet wider than what we had planned. We were like halfway through. And I just, I just said, that's too skinny. We got to go wider. Added 10 feet. In the midst of that project, uh, we had some issues with the asphalt out here. And it was, ended up, they didn't. And, and so we ended up having to recover the whole, the surface of the whole parking lot. Because half of the parking lot was still gravel. And we had, it, Okay, and I was convinced there's no money coming back the pathway. I had completely forgot about it. But here, that, that project was done early summer of 2006, and here it is, I don't know, October, November of 06. I get a call from DJ construction guy, Doug, and Doug says, Scott, can I meet with you guys? I said, yeah, you can meet with us, whatever. And so we met out, sat out here in the cafe one morning, short and sweet, said, okay, Scott, listen, we've crossed every T, we've dotted every I. And I, I don't, uh, this was literally days after the prayer meeting in the great room, the prayer there, just days after. So, Scott, I don't, uh, we've done everything to try to figure out, have we made our profit, et cetera, and we have, and so I, I want to give this back to you. This is about a 800, uh, well, it's about $900,000 projects, maybe a little bit over that, almost a million dollars. They handed me a check for $80,000. And, um, you know, you know the, I'm not going to lie to you, that money was great. <laughs> For a pastor who was staring at the books week after week after week, wondering, God, where are you? Have you brought me to this point? Just believe me. Hello? The money was great, but I can tell you, even beyond the money, 
was my heavenly father saying, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you, Scott. Just keep trusting me. Can I tell you I'm still here? We're still here. God's blessing this place. And God's blessing you through this place. God's using you to reach this community. It's still here. I'm not promising you an $80,000 check, though I, I pray it for all of you, especially if you're going to tithe. No. <clears throat> I'm joking, kind of. But joking aside, right now, listen. There's some of you saying, um, Scott, I'm going to be honest with you. When you start talking about a good, good father, I struggle with that one. You know, in, in James chapter 5, verse 13, this is what it says. When you come together, if any of you in trouble, you should pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. As I was thinking about the conclusion today, I was thinking about this. You know what I think we ought to do? There's some of you here today, you're saying, Scott, I just, I'm struggling, whatever it is. We're family here. And we want to pray for you. You're saying, I'm struggling to believe that he is a good, good father, that he's a good God. I walk through this. I walk through that. I've had Christian people treat me like I'm like the devil treats me. I mean, I, I, I had a, a, an issue, issue with my finances. I had this relationship. I, I feel betrayed by God. I feel fill in the blank for whatever reason. You came here today. You're like, I'm struggling right now to believe that He's a good God, and I, want, I know the Word says it, but I just need faith today. I need some people to pray with me. In just a moment, I want you to come. I want you to line up across the front, and then I want as many of you that would to come, and let's just smother these people in prayer for a few moments. Let's believe God to stir their faith. Let's believe God to do something. Hey, I don't care if this is your first time here or if you're a regular tender. I'm telling you, God brought you here this morning to meet you at the point of your need. If you need faith to trust Him, if you need faith and a reminder today that He is a good God, I want you to be the first one up here. Come on, everyone stand up. If